Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our ODNR program this morning with Haley Bailey. Uh, she is going to be talking about animal tracks. Thank you so much, Haley, for providing the Zoom program for us. Absolutely, I'm glad to do it. Um, so like Liz said, my name is Haley Bailey. I am a naturalist here at Mommy Bay State Park. And today we're gonna be talking about winter track identification. Um, I don't know about the weather in BG today. We're a little north of you, but our snow is finally starting to melt. Um, so this might be more useful for next year unless we do get another snowfall before it's officially spring. You never know with Ohio. Um, but with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So an introduction to tracking. Why do people do it? Um, well, there's quite a few reasons that people would want to identify tracks. Uh, they can tell a story. So you can get an idea of who's been in that area, what they're doing, and maybe if they're tra an animal traveling with babies or in a herd, or if they're by themselves or stalking a smaller animal. Um, you can also tell if they're playing um, or just kind of walking through an area very quickly. So there's a lot that we can tell just by looking at the footprints left behind. So sometimes when you go out on a nature walk, you don't see the animals themselves and it feels unsuccessful, but you can look at the ground and see what wildlife has been through the area and know that those animals are there, even if they're not in plain sight to us while we're out there enjoying the trails. They can also tell us about biodiversity or how many different species are using an area. They can also tell us if an area is a hot spot. So somewhere that a lot of animals are using, such as a riverbed, which is a nice resource of fresh drinking water for animals, or maybe underneath a tree that has fruits in season um, that a lot of different animals are coming to as a resource. So it can tell us a lot about what's popular in the area with our native wildlife as well. So something that we can do to um, kind of put this moment as something that you can remember in the future or go back to for future study, there are a couple different ways that we can uh, record these tracks and share them later with people. Um, and for future use as well for studies or labs, um, or even just to take home and show to your family and tell them about what you saw. So one way that people do this is literally just cutting the mold out of the ground. So this is more effective um, in the mud than it would be in the snow because the snow will melt. Um, so people usually can cut the entire print out of the ground when it's a dried mud. Um, other times they can use a plaster cast using plaster of Paris mixture. You can get a big bag of it at Home Depot for like $20, you mix it with water and people actually will fill a water bottle with it and take it on trails with them and um, just kind of fill in a mold, it takes about 10 to 20 minutes to dry and then they lift it out and take it home with them. Um, and so that's something that anyone is welcome to do on trails. So that's a fun way to kind of take a memento with you. There are people who collect the footprints from different animals, maybe even rare animals when they identify the track or to take home and say, hey, look at this track I saw. Does anyone know what kind of animal left this? Um, maybe it's one you're not familiar with in your area. Um, and that can be done in snow. It's a little more tricky and it depends on the weather. But some people take a mist bottle with them and they'll spritz the cast or the, the mold where the footprint is and make it icy and frozen before placing the plaster of Paris inside to create that cast. Uh, you can also do wax molds with warm wax. So again, that's one that works better with dried mud. Um, but then you can also always do a sketch of it or you can take a photo. And uh, usually when people do photos, they use something for scale um, because scale can be a big indicator for us with some tracks that look pretty similar for Ohio animals 
that you can sometimes really only tell apart by the size difference. So there are a lot of creative ways that you can um, kind of record what you're seeing. And so how can you identify those tracks? We'll get into it in more detail as the slides go on. Um, but sometimes it really comes down to personal judgment. So what you see going on, um, where in the environment you're seeing those. So for example, a beaver track, um, if you think that's what it is and it's near a riverbed, that's, you know, using your judgment, that makes sense that a beaver would be there versus up in the mountains, um, if you see a track there and it kind of looks like two different animals. If it's something whose habitat really isn't typically that area, um, you can kind of rule that out and just use your best judgment. You can also use measurements. So in these photos, you can see that they're using a ruler for scale and uh, every individual varies. So it's not always perfect, but it can give us a better estimate of a rough idea of the size of a print. The next thing that you'll do is count the digits. So that would be the toes. And some species have between three and five to even six digits. Um, so counting those can be indicators as well. The next thing is the presence of tail marks dragging behind the footprints that are intertwined with the, the tracking. Um, the presence of their claws above the toes and if there's even tufts of fur present in the imprints of their track. So luckily there's a lot of clues that we can use to hone in on what kind of animal we're looking for. You can also look at the gait patterns, which is how they walk, their movements. Um, and so we'll get into that with specific animals as we move in further to the presentation. Um, but some of them have very specific ways that they walk that help you indicate, okay, this is definitely what this animal is. All right, and then really quickly, some track terminology. So there are three different kinds of um, ways that animals put weight on their paws and uh, how they walk. So the first one is plantigrade. That is when their whole foot is flat on the ground. They put all of their weight into their foot so you'll get a whole imprint of their toes, the heel pad, um, all of the impression will be there. Typically we see that in prey animals. The next one is digit, digitigrade, which is um, usually seen in carnivores. They walk more on their toes than their whole foot. Um, so we'll see that with bobcats and coyotes. The next one is ungulagrade, which is seen in hoofed species. So in our example, that would be our white-tailed deers. And they also walk on their toes, but they have hooves. So the imprint is very specific to ungulagrades. Um, so yeah, and then there's also the anatomy, just some uh, scientific terminology, if you'll call it that, for the foot imprints. So. Uh, just so you guys know what I'm referring to moving forward, if I use a word you're not familiar with, like the carpal pad in the back, um, which you can see at the very back end of the paw print, which is not visible in most of the species we'll look at today. Um, the dew claw pad, which is that extra toe that's kind of behind the heel pad typically, the big heel pad, which would be the equivalent of our palm and then the toe pads. All right, so the first animal we're gonna talk about is the Virginia possum. They are the only marsupial in the United States and all of North America, actually. And their prints are pretty distinctive. So their front and their back paws have different prints, um, but they have five digits on both their front and their hind feet. So in their front feet, it's kind of humanoid looking because they have that big thumb on the side. So they splay that out um, and you can see that they have those five digits and they'll, they're kind of evenly spaced out 
And in the back, they have the four digits that are also evenly spaced out, but much longer than the front toes. And then that thumb is much further out in the back foot and it's much thicker and wider. And you'll also see that their heel pad is a very specific shape. Um, and so when you're looking at these tracks in the wild, you can compare the heel pad shapes and how far apart their toes are and the shape of those toes um, to tell what they are. You can also see in the bottom left that uh, drawn description of their tracks that their claws are present as well. Uh, that's not the case for all of the animals that we'll be going over today, but for these guys, their claws are present. So that's another indicator for us as well. And these guys are also a plantigrade species. So they walk with their weight fully on their feet. Um, so usually the full impression of their foot is present when you see these tracks. Next up, we have the raccoon. So they're, they also have five digits on all of their feet. Uh, in the back, just like the possum, their toes are a bit longer and uh, skinnier, more of an oval shape. Their front feet are smaller than their back feet. Um, however, they do look very similar in uh, size and shape to the, the front and the back feet. Um, the middle three of their toes are the longest, and then the ones on the side, the left and right, are um, about the same length versus having a thumb-like look like the possum does. And when we talked earlier about gait patterns of animals, for the raccoon, they walk in a way where they place their left back foot besides the right front foot, kind of like in its place as they're moving forward. Um, and so they kind of lean back and forth a little bit as they walk. And uh, that shows with where they place their feet typically. And then there's also the hand for size comparison, um, which is helpful for telling what species it is as well. So next we have our Mustelidae species, which are the skunk, mink, otter, and badger. These are all species that we find here in Ohio. Um, sometimes people are surprised by the badger and the otter. Uh, the badger, we have one confirmed about a half an hour from us in one of the Toledo metro parks, not here in Mommy Bay though. And otters, we're starting to see a return of them here in Ohio, um, especially in the Cuyahoga River. So over near Cleveland more so than here, but they are making a comeback. And depending on where you're going in Ohio on trails, you may spot some of these. So the skunk is where we'll start. So their hind feet have a long heel pad and their claw impression is present. So you can see the claws above the toes. Their front claws are much longer. And that's because skunks like to dig into the ground looking for grubs and different things. Um, and even when they're not digging, those claws are much longer and they're visible in their track. Um, and we'll get into photos in a second so you can see what I'm talking about. The next one is a mink. If you're not familiar with minks, they are in the weasel family. They look a bit like a ferret, but they're all brown and they hang out near riverbeds. They will eat little mussels and clams and break them open. And all four of their feet are identical, which makes it nice and easy for identifying their tracks. Uh, they also stick their back feet into the paw impressions where their front feet had just stepped. So it kind of looks like something walking on two legs more than four. Um, and so sometimes that can muddle how the paw print looks because they're putting it in the same exact spot and pressing down again. Um, but you can tell by the gait and noticing that it's two feet, it looks more like two feet instead of four. Um, the next one is the river otter. This one is fun because they like to slide in the snow. So usually there's kind of a slide impression associated with their paw prints that you can see very clearly. 
Um, they drag their tail when they walk as well. So even if they're not sliding, uh, their, their tail is present with their tracks. Now their front feet, uh, their back feet, not so much, but their front feet, they have webbing because they are a species that swims quite a lot. Um, and that webbing is something that you can see between their toes in their prints as well. And then finally, the badger, just like the skunk, they have really long claws. And actually for these guys, it's in their hind feet instead of their front feet. So they're long like the skunk um, and their front feet are much smaller. So we'll get into some photos. So here we have the skunk on the left and you can see their hind feet are much bigger than their front feet. And they have that distinctive shape to their heel pad in the back. Um, it's kind of got like a little um, cut into it on the left, like a notch, um, but it's very large and a flat shape. And you can see those claw marks very clearly. Now with the mink in the middle, you can see that they aren't, those claws are not as prominent because they don't have those extra long claws like our skunk and badger do. And that hind foot, they have the toes a little more spread out than the front. And that's a variation that you can see um, in any of the tracks that you look at. Just like we can spread our fingers apart um, they can do that as well while they're walking. So uh, the distance between the toe pads is not always a perfect indicator of things, but it gives us a general idea of their walking patterns. And then on the right, we have the badger and you can see that their heel pads, uh, the front one looks kind of like a boomerang and the hind one is broken up into a couple smaller heel pads. Um, and so these are the shapes that I've mentioned that they can be pretty distinctive to each species. And so we can rely on those quite a bit for identifying them. And then here's our otter. And you can see those fun <laughs> marks in the snow where they kind of slide and then hop. Um, and that's how they prefer to move through the snow. So it, it's fun to look at. And um, it shows that story as well. As you're looking at those tracks, you can tell how they're moving through an area. And you can see in that bottom photo that those front feet have the webbing and the hinds do not. All right, next we've got our canids. So we have the Eastern Coyote, the Red Fox, and then also domestic dogs here that we can see. I like to include domestic dogs because lots of people like to take their dogs on the trails recreationally. Um, and so those can be very tricky and easy to mix up with the coyote especially. Um, and so this is another example of where you can use your personal judgment for which one you think the tracks belong to um, because they can be a little difficult to tell apart, but we do have some tips that we can use to help us determine who's who. So Eastern coyotes, um, the front feet are larger than the back feet. However, both feet have four toes that are the same size. The heel pads are um, in the front, they're much wider and more of a triangular shape. And in the back, it's more compressed. Their claws are visible on the front and the back feet which becomes important when we compare it to the dog in a moment. With red foxes, their toes are more round than an oval shape compared to the coyote, and they have a very small heel pad. And also their entire um, circumference of their toe print is much smaller than the coyote. So they're usually much easier to distinguish between versus the coyote and maybe a bigger dog. Uh, they also have a gait that is kind of a straight line with dainty footsteps, uh, as I've heard it said. So they walk in a very straight line and their toes show that. Their toes uh, almost go in a straight line 
And um, yeah, that's something that you can notice with their tracks, whereas dogs and coyotes, their, I, uh, their tracks will be more spread apart from each other and outwards and more like two lines than one. The other thing I mentioned is the outer toe tips start where the inner toes end. That just means the very top of those um, toe tips for the two outer toes, they stop right where the other ones start going upwards. So there's no overlay between those. However, if you look to the right of the screen, you can see that with dogs and coyotes, uh, that's not the case for their toes. All of their toes kind of overlap that shape. Now with dogs, the track sizes can vary a lot, right? Because we have a lot of different breeds of dogs and variation in size and gait shape based on how big of steps they can take. Um, with these guys, their uh, toe pads are a little wider than the coyote and their heel pads are as well. Uh, they're closer together and the claw prints are only noticeable with the front feet. So uh, it can be an indicator if you're seeing some prints that are mixed where some you can see the claws and some you cannot, it's more likely to be a dog than a coyote. Here's some better photos to give you an idea of what we were talking about. So on the left, we have the coyote and you can see that heel shape impression pretty well. And then with the fox, you can see there's more of an X pattern between the toes and the heel pad um, that's distinct in that negative space. And you can tell that those toes are more of a circular shape than the other two prints posted. And then on the right, we have the domestic dog. And you can see that that heel pad is a thicker, more full triangular shape than the coyotes. But it's very easy to mix up when you're on a trail and you're looking at them in person. Um, and so these are just some tips to help, but it can be difficult to distinguish between them. Next up, we have cats. So uh, we're going to talk about the bobcat and then also domestic cats because there are many outdoor and feral cats um, that can be found on the trails as well. Um, and so the easiest way to tell the difference between those and a bobcat is the size. And there's not much variation in domestic cats, luckily. So it's pretty easy for us to tell just based on the size alone, which one is a bobcat versus a regular domestic cat. And um, for both of these, they have four toes. And unlike the canids, they can retract their claws. So the claw marks are not going to be present with these footsteps. Um, you can also see that the bobcat's heel pad has a bit more of a slope on the right of it than the house cat's. And so it's a bit of a different shape than the, the house cat's prints. Um, but really for us, the biggest thing is size. And so some people take rulers out with them to measure the prints. And if you don't, just having anything in the photo that you can use for scale, such as your hand, that you can go back later and use your best judgment for um, a rough idea of the size of the prints. And just like the fox, you can kind of see the prints are dainty and they walk in almost a straight line with their back feet going right behind where their front feet stepped. Next, we'll talk about some rodents. So uh, groundhogs and squirrels. So with groundhogs, the claw marks are visible. Uh, they have long claws, just like our badger and skunk do for digging into the ground. Their toes visibly connect to the paw pad. So instead of hovering above it in the print, they connect to it. And they also have five in the front and six in the back, little heel pads that come together to form a bigger print. So that's a very distinctive shape. And we'll show you a photo on the next slide to um, give you a better idea of that. 
with the gray squirrels, their fur, uh, the outline of that fuzz is present in their paw print, which is something we haven't seen much in the animals discussed so far. Um, but with these guys, it's a very clear uh, impression of the fur along with the toes. So that can be helpful. So they have four toes in the front and five in the back. There are four circular smaller heel pads. And with these guys, the claw marks are visible as well and attached to the top of the toe prints instead of hovering above those. So here are those examples. And with the groundhog, you can kind of see a light impression where the toes have that um, bit of connection to the heel pad there and how unique and distinctive those heel pad shapes are for the front and the hind foot. And also how the front have the four toes versus the back with five, same with the squirrel. And you can see that uh, the squirrel has the full foot impression versus having multiple different heel pads like the groundhog does. All right. Next, we'll talk about beavers and muskrats. If you've ever been able to come up to Mommy Bay State Park, you'll know that we have lots of muskrats here. They love the swampy areas up here. And we're starting to see beavers return as well. Right now, we've had one confirmed beaver in the park, which is exciting um, because we haven't seen those in the area yet uh, before. So with these guys, you can tell the difference by size, just like the bobcat and cat comparison. The beaver is much bigger than the muskrat. With the muskrats, their paw pad size is about an inch and a half. With beavers, they're seven inches. So there's a very clear difference. It's pretty dramatic. So with the muskrats, they have five very long toe pads that kind of look like fingers like ours do. And their tail drags in the snow behind them. So their tail is usually visible with their tracks. Uh, unlike the beavers who have that flat, broad tail, if you've never seen a muskrat, they have a long, thin tail and it kind of resembles a rat's tail. With the beaver, as mentioned, they have that very big seven inch circumference to their track. Um, the toes and the heel pad connect and they are very flat footed. So it's a heavy impression of the whole print. And unlike our otters who have the webbing in the front, the beavers have the webbing in their back feet. So here's some photos. So on the left, we have our muskrat and their little tail dragging in the snow with them. And it kind of covers up some of their prints, but because we don't have too many species who have that tail drag like that, it's still an easy way to tell that it's a muskrat, especially if you're in an, a wetland kind of area. Um, you can guess that these guys call that area home. Uh, so, they are more likely to be found there, which makes identifying the tracks a little easier. And with our beavers, they kind of look like fingerprints or like a really big frog print. You can see those toes are really heavily planted into their steps. Um, and they've got those really, really long toe pads that connect to the heel pad. And their tail drag isn't as distinctive as the muskrats. Next, we have the Eastern Cottontail. These guys also press their whole foot flat into the ground. So you get an impression of the toes and the heel pad, but also all of the fur around the heel. So you get the whole foot impression. The front feet are much smaller than the back. They are more of a circular shape and the toes are close together. Whereas with the back, they're that long oval shape and the whole heel is present. And you can kind of see here, they move their back feet together because 
they hop when they move. Um, and so that's another gait pattern that can be examined. And you can, you can tell if those front feet to you look a bit like a cat or a fox, the presence of those hind feet and the movement that looks like they're hopping can tell you that it's an Eastern cottontail. All right, and then lastly, we have our white-tailed deer. As I mentioned earlier, some of these animals have a dew claw present, which is behind the heel pad. And surprisingly for deer, you can sometimes see that impression. So in this photo that we have on the bottom, on the left print, you can see those dew claws present. And these are about three and a half inches in size. They mostly are known for those two symmetrical um, heel pads that are like an upside down heart shape next to each other. And they can be more spread out, so less of a heart shape if they have it spread apart while they're moving. Um, depending on how fast they're walking, they may have those toes spread apart. But yeah, that brings us to the end. Just some, oh, actually we have birds too. I forgot I added these guys in. <laughs> All right, so we'll cover birds really quickly. This is the last one though. Um, so birds encompass a whole umbrella of different species. These ones are much more difficult to tell apart by uh, into individual species just by the track. Um, we can, however, break up some of them to at least determine if it's a songbird or waterfowl or a bird of prey. And so actually with these photos here on the left, we have a songbird, the middle is waterfowl, and then the right is an owl print, so a bird of prey. So the waterfowl are easily distinguished because they have that webbing that connects all the way to the toe tips and usually they have three toes in the front and then a longer one in the back that doesn't have the webbing attached. Um, and there's not really a heel pad present, which is distinctive with the mammals. So that can be another easy way to tell that it's a bird instead of a mammal. Now with songbirds, they can either have two toes in the front and two in the back like an X shape or three in the front and one in the back like the waterfowl. However, they will lack webbing and they'll usually be much smaller than the waterfowl. And then with the birds of prey or raptors, they have three or four toes, depending on the species, with claws visible above all of the toes. And um, as you can see with this owl print on the right, uh, they've got kind of lumpy toe pads that continue all the way down and you can tell their segments uh, making marks between each toe. And they kind of have a thumb that's splayed out and they'll use those to grip their prey with. Um, so they've got a bit more dexterity than our songbirds in terms of movement of their toes. All right, and then that brings us to the conclusion of just some general species that you may find in Ohio and how to tell their tracks apart. Some important notes are, of course, be respectful of wildlife and give them space. Um, you know, getting too close and encroaching on their territory can make some animals extremely uncomfortable and they will flee and stop what they are doing. And so we don't wanna disrupt what they're doing in nature. We just want to enjoy them and know that they are present in a habitat. And so one way that you can help with that is if you see that tracks are fresh, whether it be from it's raining and so mud is forming and the tracks are just now made, or if it's snowing heavy, um, but you can still clearly see the whole print you can tell that it was just put in the snow not too long ago. And so sometimes people will recommend that you just follow the tracks backwards instead of forwards so you don't run into that animal. And that can also be useful for some predator species. Um, they're more scared of us than we are of them. 
Um, but if it is a coyote or a bobcat, you may want to give them more space um, just to keep yourself and the wildlife safe. And then here's some work cited as some books that I referenced for this slide presentation. And on that note, does anyone have any questions? I did prompt you all to unmute uh, to make it a little easier. If you do have any questions for Haley, go ahead and ask those now. Carlton, did you have a question? What happened to the other lady who gave these presentations from Mommy <laughs> Big State Park Nature Center? That's Lauren and she's on maternity leave. She just had oh. a baby girl. Oh, she'll be back then. <laughs> yes, she will. <laughs> oh, good. Have you been there a long time? Uh, so I started in August of last year. Oh, okay. Very yeah, nice so I'm, yeah, so I'm fairly new to the park. Well, I learned a lot. Very nice presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll be, you know, cognizant of these little prints that we see when we go off for our walks. We're, we're only a mile from the, uh, one of the newer preserves uh, under the Metro Park system here in Lucas County. It's called Manhattan Marsh. Oh, neat. And uh, there's a 1.3 mile loop trail. And the last time we went around that about oh, a week and a half ago, it, it was uh, not cleared of snow. So we saw a lot of prints. But there I you go. No, but I had no idea what the prints were, you know, except for here around the house, which we have two cats and a dog. <laughs> and every once in a while, a visiting animal. and. Uh, but uh, I'll be more cognizant. And we're supposed to have a light snow coming in here. Maybe they say one to three inches. Hmm. So there'll be some nice fresh prints I can look for. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and with it being a marsh, you'll see a lot of these species, hopefully. So like the minks and the muskrats um, and other creatures that call the marshlands home. And, uh, the other question I had is when are they going to start uh, rebuilding the boardwalk? Uh, 2023. Oh, next year. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it it's open right now still, um, and they're going to start renovations in 2023. That's the projected plan oh, right now. Okay. I wish they'd have a little bit more on the handrail side. I do too. <laughs> so hopefully with our renovations, they add that because when the boards are wet, they do tend to get slippery. Right. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Are there any other questions that I can answer for anyone today? No other questions? Carol, you are unmuted. Did you have any questions? No, I, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, I'm always looking for coyote tracks because I raise chickens. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, they can be useful for that too. You can tell yeah. who's visiting and checking out your chickens oh, yeah. when you're not around. <laughs> yeah, I, I feed them well. They're, they're healthy coyotes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Haley, for providing this thank program you. today. Uh, we really appreciate you being here and I have a large pasture at my house and when we had that last snowfall there was like this little trail of tracks and of course they're gone now so I can't go out and check it out to see what they were. Uh, but, so this would have been useful a week ago so <laughs> thank you so much we really appreciate you providing this for us. Uh, Absolutely. Thank yeah. Thank yeah. You thank all. you everyone for joining and listening today. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.